Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Groundwork Ohio's second morning meeting. This is a weekly series we will be hosting now through the state budget cycle. We're really excited to welcome a variety of public policy experts, lobbyists, elected officials, and other leaders. And I'm really, really excited to share uh, today's speakers with you, our friends from the Ohio Association of Food Banks. We have Jory Novotny, who is the executive director at the food banks. She started in this role last year after 13 years in progressive leadership roles throughout the organization, including managing communications, grants and contracts and public policy as their external relations director. Most recently, she served as chief of staff. Prior to joining the Ohio Association of Food Banks, Jory was um, an AmeriCorps VISTA member at the Akron Canton Regional Food Bank. In her role now as executive director, Jory is honored to represent Ohio's 12 Feeding America food banks, their 3,600 local hunger relief partners, and the millions of Ohioans who are at risk for food insecurity. We are also welcoming Hope Lane Gavin, who is the Director of Nutrition Policy and Programs with Ohio Association of Food Banks. Hope focuses on strengthening access to public assistance programs um, aimed at eliminating food insecurity and improving public health outcomes. Before she was in this role, Hope served as the Health Equity Fellow with the Center for Community Solutions, where she led their maternal health, racism as a public health crisis, and nutrition access portfolios around the state. Hope has acted as both a staffer and lobbyist in the Ohio General Assembly, and I can personally testify that these women are both absolute experts in this field. I love working with them. I learn something new from them every time I talk to them about food insecurity and policy in the state, and they're excellent uh, partners to Groundwork. So we're really grateful to have you here today. I am going to invite Jory to share the, share the slide deck that they'll be moving through. As a reminder, this entire meeting will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. And at about 9.55, we'll break for any kind of big picture questions that folks might have. But if you have something time sensitive, please throw it in the chat and I'll try to help flag uh, for Jory and Hope if we have something that needs answered in the moment related to a slide. With that, I'll go ahead and go off camera so you can run the show and take it away, Jory and Hope. Thanks, I just needed to uh, unmute myself before I go back to sharing. <laughs> no problem. Perfect. Um, had it down until I needed to switch that around. Okay, we're all set. Um, I believe you can see my screen. Um, thank you so much, Brittany, for that uh, super kind introduction. We're happy to be here for the morning meeting. I love this cadence and uh, I love like this little check-in. You get going, you move fast. So I'm not going to belabor too much because we want to get through what um, we have to update you all on today. Um, Brittany and the team at Groundwork Ohio that we're, we're happy and proud to partner with asked us to talk with you a little bit more generally about food insecurity and its impact on um, young children and their caregivers and families. And then zoom in a little bit on WIC in particular, the Women, Infants, and Children program. So I'm going to do the first part of that, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Hope, to do the next part. Um, as Brittany shared, we represent Ohio's largest charitable response to hunger. So we work with Ohio's 12 Feeding America food banks and their partners to provide food and other resources to people in need. And we work on a lot of, a lot of public policies because we know that hunger is a symptom of poverty and poverty is a symptom of many root causes. Um, so just for folks that aren't familiar with our network, the food banks that we represent are multi-county, multi-service organizations that have large warehouses that bring in and move out millions of pounds of food every year. And they have many, many spokes and wheels of very different sizes and shapes and um, experiences throughout all 88 counties in Ohio. Those are our 3,600 local hunger relief partners many of whom are food pantries, but we also support supplemental feeding sites, hot meal programs and shelters, um, and place-based services. In our most recent fiscal year, so you kind of get the scope of the impact that our collective network has, um, just through our food pantry network, we provided take-home groceries to households with children, just our households with children more than 2.2 million times. Um, children make up about 30% of everyone we serve, and of course, those children live in families, and we're serving a huge number of them throughout the year. Um, we provided about 73 million meals worth of food just through our emer emergency food pantries alone, just to kids last year. Um, and of course, we serve any Ohioan who's income eligible and needs our help. 
I wanted to briefly share with you some um, learning that we did through a statewide hunger study earlier this year. We anonymously surveyed 2,300 neighbors who came to food pantries and food distributions across the state, and we asked them questions about themselves and their circumstances. So I'm going to zoom in on a couple of things that have impact for our young children and their families. Um, just so you know, you know, we asked basic questions about income situations. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to this group that almost every household that we, we surveyed have incomes below Ohio's median household income, and 75% of the household had incomes of less than $25,000. Um, about three in four households include at least one member under 18, over 60, and or disabled. We asked many things about those we surveyed, including those that are eligible for SNAP, how long their SNAP benefit lasts, um, because we know that SNAP benefit adequacy is a significant challenge for families, especially in the ongoing wake of the end of pandemic era emergency uh, SNAP benefits. Um, so nearly 60% of neighbors that were visiting Ohio food pantries this year said they do not currently receive any SNAP benefit. But of those that do receive SNAP benefits, most are exhausting their SNAP benefits well before their food needs are met throughout the month. Um, we know that chronic health conditions are, are widely common among food pantry visitors, um, many of whom have diet-related conditions, and they know that they can treat and prevent those conditions and prevent the worsening of those conditions through access to healthy, wholesome, nutritious food. And um, which is why, you know, they're seeking out help from us and um, why also they often struggle in a chronic cycle of um, worsening conditions uh, related to their health. So we surveyed them about a variety of, of factors having to do with their household ha health status. And of course, we're very concerned about um, the implications of those, um, those challenges um, and working actively to integrate food as medicine as a tool throughout all of how how we and all of our partners and our public policies um, think about access to nutritious food. We asked specifically about access to affordable care, um, found that roughly 50% higher uninsured rate among food pantry visitors than Ohio's overall population. So we are also actively involved um, as Ohio's largest navigator program in helping people access affordable co coverage, both through Medicaid if they're eligible, as well as through affordable healthcare options through the health insurance marketplace. And this is really a focus area of us to reduce those health coverage disparities. Um, obviously, people are making a lot of extremely difficult choices between affording the food they need or affording their medicine or medical care, which is really frustrating because we know and believe that food is medicine. So choosing between one or the other does not set up anyone for success. A lot of folks are also making difficult trade-offs and making tough coping choices to get by each month. Um, more than what well, roughly two thirds are choosing between affording the food they need or affording their utilities. About half are making choices between food and shelter. You can see a, a huge amount are choosing between affording transportation and food. And we also see, of course, pressure on affording educational expenses. That, that can include both college students, non-traditional students who are going back and trying to better themselves in their career path, um, as well as parents that are trying to provide for their kids' educational needs. Um, and also, of course, folks making choices between affording childcare so that they can get to work and bring in more income for their household or continuing to put food on the table. I think what's most troubling to us of everything we learned is the, the just really unacceptable number of households that are still forced to regularly skip meals. And of course, as you know so well, children live in families. Um, and whether a parent or caregiver has access to the food they need directly impacts that child. Um, and we're really concerned about the, the extreme rate at which Ohio adults are being forced to skip meals or reduce the quality of the meals that they're consuming. Um, we asked folks about their future need for help with food and, um, you know, unfortunately, we're, we heard very loudly and clearly that folks aren't predicting that they expect things to get better for them. Um, in fact, 
almost all of the 2,300 food pantry visitors we surveyed said that they would need help as often or more often in the upcoming 12 months, including a third that said that they would need help more often. So with all of that said, we know that our network cannot be the answer to all of those nutritional needs. Um, we try to fill as many gaps as possible as we can. And one really challenging gap for us to fill are certain and specific nutritional needs for our youngest Ohioans. Um, I hope it's going to go into kind of the state of WIC a little bit more, but I just wanted you to have the scope of what we're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis to meet um, ongoing nutritional needs and the um, breadth of what we're doing as a statewide emergency response network um, so that we can really zoom in on how critical it is that every person who is eligible for federal federal nutrition programs like WIC has access to it. And I, I will turn it over to Hope to provide you an update on the state of, of WIC in Ohio. Thanks, Jory. And thanks, Brady, so much for the very kind introduction. Um, please forgive me, everyone. I'm a little sick this morning, but this meant a lot to me to do. So um, just bear with me. Um, before I really get started, though, it would be really helpful to, for me to know how familiar this group is with the WIC program. I don't know if people can give like the, the, the thumbs up, the physical thumbs up, the reaction button, something in the comments, something in the chat. Um, I just want to make sure I don't need to level set as to what the program how it's supposed to work. Um, okay, awesome. So it seems like people are familiar. Okay, awesome. So I won't go into um, the basis of the program. So our work um, in WIC began during the pandemic. Um, if you're joining us this AM, I'm confident you are intimately familiar with the state of health and human services during that time. Many Americans were newly eligible for and accessing a myriad of benefits due to the sudden state of the economy in an attempt to cobble together enough resources to get their basic needs met. Enrollment in programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, and Medicaid, for example, skyrocketed across the country, as is usual for times of economic downturn. However, the story of the uh, Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, was a bit different. In the 2010 um, Federal uh, Child Nutrition Reauthorization, which is a federal nutrition bill that is supposed to be passed every five years that reauthorizes federal school meal and child nutrition programs, Congress required states to transition their WIC programs to EBT by 2020. Many of you may remember WIC as the program known for its very large and off-putting yellow vouchers that were institute uh, that were instit uh, that instituted stigma on participants. Not only were those vouchers inconvenient for beneficiaries, but they were a nightmare for cashiers, for grocers and vendors, and the administrating agencies. As part of this transition to EBT, states needed to make a decision on whether or not they were going to continue having their programs be offline or online. Offline meaning that although benefits themselves were being transmitted remotely to grocers, appointments and interactions with the agency needed to be in person and physically getting the benefits onto the card needed to be in person. So WIC staff have to physically run WIC cards through a machine just to get the benefits loaded onto the card every three months, in other words. So Ohio is one of nine states who chose to uh, maintain an offline WIC program. What's even stranger about Ohio, even among the group of strange states, which includes Arkansas, Texas, Utah, Louisiana, is that we are the only state that doesn't even have a WIC vendor. So our state agency, which is the Department of Health, manages the entire system. Because of this, there's not even like a customer service system or line for beneficiaries to call when and if having issues with the card, to check their balance, et cetera. As a surprise to no one, while WIC enrollment increased around the country alongside other benefit programs, as we discussed, in the nine states where benefit um, participation was contingent on being in person, um, enrollment plummeted. Ohio's WIC enrollment fell by 16% between December of 2019 and December 2021. Enrollment still has not recovered to pre-pandemic levels. So I bet you're curious how the program even operated during uh, stay-at-home orders and government shutdowns. While every county did uh, things differently in our state, many WIC offices were simply having participants physically come to the parking lots of the clinic and either sliding the card through a window crack that is if you actually have a car. So we're talking about very vulnerable populations here where transportation is a huge barrier, as we all know. Um, but if you do have a vehicle, 
They were having you literally like slide the card through a window crack or dropping the card in a Lowe's bucket, literally a Lowe's bucket while waiting for staff to bring your card back that had the benefits loaded on it. As you can imagine, <laughs> this was a logistical nightmare to put it kindly and was not very efficient. So in 2021 and 2022, we did interviews with both county WIC administrators as well as WIC participants around the state to determine what the biggest barriers were to participation. Overwhelmingly, we learned that the biggest challenge was the offline antiquated system. It's truly a time tax. It's truly a burden. Other challenges, though, um, unrelated to being offline include um, not being able to use the benefits at self-checkout. Um, vendor compliance is also a huge issue. So if you think about it this way, um, one of the one of the aspects of the WIC program is a is a fruit and vegetable voucher, a fruit and vegetable cash voucher. And so you get the voucher and, you know, most people are very familiar as to what a fruit and what a vegetable is. But when you're getting pro if you're a grocery store and you're getting product and you happen to get, let's say, blueberries, right, from a different vendor than you normally get your blueberries from, you have to scan those UPC codes as WIC eligible or they're not going to be in the system as WIC eligible. So vendor compliance has been a huge issue in our state. Um, for over the past several years. Um, and I identified that challenge um, through just, again, conversations with both WIC administrators um, and WIC participants. Um, another issue, another huge challenge in the in the program is, again, just um, getting participants to stay on the program through um, the, the child turning uh, five. That another, um, a big a big reason for that is just how inaccessible the program is um after um the first year when um participants are less likely to be trying to access a breastfeeding support um and formula supports um often children just fall off the program though they are eligible for the program through age five so that's another um huge barrier um the Department of Health has indicated in the media for the past several years that they are working to move online. I unfortunately do not have a more detailed status update beyond that. I do know that remaining offline has deeply impacted access in other ways. Um, the formula shortage is um, another um, aspect of that, which many parents would argue is still going on. Um, the form, the being offline um, made it incredibly difficult to have any flexibility um, when it came to the formula shortage just, I was going to say just a few years ago, but again, I've heard from many parents um, that there's still um, empty shelves, um, depending on what you're looking for, um, especially when it comes to Similac and Abbott. But um, but the being offline made made the USDA, when the formula shortage was was at its height, USDA had um, flex built-in flexibilities for um, WIC participants to be able to access. Um, if, if you're familiar with the WIC program, you're familiar with, uh, it's very prescriptive. And so you are, participants are prescribed like a very specific brand, a very specific size. Um, and, um, but there's flexibilities built into that. Offline states were not able to utilize those flexibilities due to the fact that any changes to your um, benefit package had to be changed in person. So if you imagine if you're a parent and you go to Walmart and your child normally takes the blue can of Similac and you're prescribed 16 ounces and you go and they don't have that blue can of Similac, but they do have the orange can and you're like, OK, I need something. I'm just going to try to take the orange can in Ohio. You have to call your WIC clinic, hope they're open, right? Hope it's not 7 p.m. on a Saturday. So you call your WIC clinic and you say, hey, they don't have the blue 16 ounce can. They only have the 20 ounce orange can. Can you add that to my cart? And they're like, yeah. So you have to physically get back in your car, again, assuming you have a car, <laughs> and go to the WIC clinic have them re change your benefit physically on the card and then go back to Walmart and hope that that 20 ounce orange can of Similac is still on the shelf. So you can see um, why being offline is incredibly burdensome. It's incredibly, it makes the program incredibly inaccessible in our state. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to share, um, share what we were kind of monitoring and working on in that vein um, with this group. Um, I, I think that's it for me, but I'm happy to take any questions. And it looks like Jory just hopped off, so I wanted to see if she had anything to add. 
Yeah, thank you, Hope. I'm sure folks have questions. I just want to close and then open it to questions just by stating um, what I, I always end presentations with this reminder that in order to cultivate any other possibilities, folks have to have the promise of adequate wholesome food. Um, that's a necessity and we're committed to that. And, um, you, you know, in particular, of course, for our youngest Ohioan. So we're pleased um, to take questions and be in conversation with you at this point. Thank you both so much. And I see some questions already popping up. I'll go ahead and start with Kayla. Thanks for popping your hand into the chat. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for uh, that information. So I'm curious to know what the thinking was about being offline. Were there benefits or pros to that decision? Because obviously you didn't list any but the cons. <laughs> Yeah, great question, Kayla. Yeah. So honestly, um, the program, the, the history of the WIC program is, con some would argue is, it's a nutrition program, but it's also a health program. And being offline allowed far more interactions with the, with the beneficiaries, again, requiring them to come in, do nutrition education, um, touch base in person, like there is a lot of value in that. Um, and that can be done online too, which is why, you know, the other 43 states chose to do it that way. Um, but the thinking was, is like, basically maintaining the in-person requirement um, helps with the fulfillment of what the program was supposed to, to do. Thank you, Hope. Are there other questions? <clears throat> out there before groundwork always has questions. So we'll pause and let others try. <laughs> and I'll just note while folks are thinking, um, we have been chatting with Hope and Jory as we develop our public policy agenda coming into the next budget cycle, which we'll be sharing next month. Um, but we've definitely added provisions around um, some of the barriers that WIC just, or that Hope just described around WIC access. So um, including uh, online renewals, permitting telehealth appointments, um, and enabling WIC benefits to be automatically uh, reloaded. So um, some of those are already included in our public policy agenda, and we'll keep in close contact with Hope and Jory about ways that we can amplify those and legislators who might be warm to these ideas. Can yes. I make a follow-up comment? Of yeah. course. Okay, so um, I am an early childhood mental health consultant, and we live in that um, prenatal to about preschool audience range. And to your comment about uh, connection, I'm just thinking out loud. I know we're all here to like, I guess, connect and put resources together and things like that. That is where we live of like building relationships and connections and uh, positive coping skills and things like that. So it's just making me wonder how the ECMH field can contribute to this. Cause I know there has been conversations about how ECMH can not just be in the classroom, but also in those, um, those other sectors like health and social determinants of health and things like that. So that's very interesting to me. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that um, often the, well, always the most effective advocates are the people living the experience and the next best advocate are the people who are providing daily services to um, those who are impacted by good or good policies or policies that have room for improvement, like we talked about. So um, it couldn't be more valuable. Um, like when we talk about, for example, um, healthy school meals for all and what we saw during the pandemic in the way of um, access to every child in their school or at home um, through non-congregate feeding mechanisms that were put in place during the pandemic so that every child had access to breakfast and lunch through their school system. Um, and what we've lost in the aftermath of, of, of that policy at the federal level, um, I think like that's been so successful because teachers have continued to raise their hand and talk about what they see every day in the classroom and how it directly impacts. You know, we can have all the data and research in the world and we need it, but we also need the direct lived experience. So, so thank you. Thanks, Jory. Do we have any other questions among our group? I know we've got some folks who um, are leaders in the childcare space uh, that are on the chat today. Uh, I'm wondering, Hope and Joy, if there's anything specifically that 
that that community could do to amplify your work, or if there are connectivities that we can make there for, for um, child care providers around access to food. I, I know we've got folks from Children's Hunger Alliance on as well, and they've done some great work um, and continue to do amazing work with um, the folks in the child care space. Is there any specific ask we could make of those folks today? And I didn't prep them for this, so sorry. No, I'm, just, no, no, I'm no. just brainstorming. <laughs> sure, absolutely. I think that um, I'll just say briefly that the the historical landscape of charitable hunger relief is rooted in the faith-based community. And there was a time at which the vast majority of providers of emergency hunger relief were within the faith-based community. We still have a very significant and rich commitment from across Ohio, from the faith-based community toward um, access to food and nutrition. But we've also seen, of course, attrition in the number of congregations in their ability to participate in that work. Um, and often it makes it, um, there are areas of the state where um, declining participation in, in worship and places of worship are leading to declining access to food. So we have often pivoted to place-based services, especially in communities where that kind of transition and attrition is occurring. Um, and so if you think of yourself as a place-based, a trusted provider that families know and have access to, um, we know that you have a lot on your plates, but you, you're you familiar with your kind of local landscape in the same way that so many of our schools, our K through 12 schools are and our libraries, these are very common place-based partners where we can um, help to make connections to food access that, you know, might not have been how we did it in years past, but how we need to do it going forward so that we don't lose access to that food. And we always welcome you to join our uh, action alerts. We, of course, um, share many of the same advocacy priorities with our partners at Groundwork and through the table at the Advocates for Ohio's Future um, space and coalition. Um, but you can visit OhioFoodBanks.org and sign up for our action alerts and stay tuned with both federal policies as well as state level policies. Amazing. Thank you, Jory. And I put the link to the website in the chat. So I encourage everybody who's on our call today to visit their website and sign up for those action alerts. I see Hope also put her email address in the chat as well. So if you think of questions after today, um, or if you um, have kind of follow up around some of these place-based connectivities, feel free to reach out to, to these wonderful folks, and I'm sure they can help connect you with the right folks. Hope, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I was, yeah, actually, I was going to say something and then Eileen put something in. Oh yeah, I see this gonna question. Double down on, on what she was saying. Perfect. Um, I was gonna say if anybody has questions outside, including but not limited to WIC. So on the SNAP program there, um, in, in the upcoming state budget, we historically have had to um, fight off a tax to limit access, further limit access to the SNAP program. Um, also, uh, Healthy School Meals for All, there's a campaign for that. Um, there are just like several, several things cooking in the nutrition space that if anybody wants to um, connect on those things, we are happy to to chat about those um, too. So WIC is included, but not limited to WIC. Um, we know how important the SNAP program is to children and families in the state, as Jory articulated, as well as the, the Hunger Relief Network. Um, even if the federal farm bill, if people are interested in the status of that, um, there has not been a child nutrition reauthorization since that 2010 one that I mentioned. Um, it's like I said, it's supposed to be passed every five years. Um, so you can do the math as to how far behind we are. Um, so if anybody wants to chat about any of those um, bills, those policies or programs, we're happy to touch base on that too. Thank you for the time, Brittany, and the space. And we look forward to being partners with all of you in this, uh, what will be a, an uphill battle of a state budget. And I know that we can link arms and, and make headway together. So thank you all for what you do every day. Thank you, Hope. Thank you, Jory. It was such a pleasure to talk with you again this morning. I'll just remind everybody we'll meet again next Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m., November 7th. We will have Joel Potts, who's the Chief Government and External Affairs Officer at the Ohio Department of Children and Youth. Um, so really excited to welcome him. We'll post this recording on YouTube, and y'all are welcome to share it with anybody from your teams who um, didn't have the chance to dial in today. Thanks again, Jory and Hope. We look forward to continuing to work in partnership with you. And everyone have a safe and wonderful trick-or-treat for those who are participating tonight. Take care, everyone.